I want to thank Brother Boren and the elders and this congregation as a whole for the opportunity of being with you. I have certainly been for numerous years now impressed with the work of the Brown Trail Church of Christ, the School of Preaching. I am more impressed now, and I'm very happy that I've been able to be here. Your influence has already been immense, and I am praying that God will continue to bless you with that great influence that it might be even greater. May I say just a word? We have 1,467 students did have this last fall at Fried Hardeman. We think it is a fine liberal arts school. We now have four master's degrees. We have over 160 students majoring in Bible. Uh, we are not in competition with any other school, but if there are those of you who have either children or grandchildren whose names you'd like to give me, or if some of the young men, as I announced today, after they finish the school here, are interested in any of our programs, I'd be very happy to receive names and or talk to you about that. By the way, I'll have to leave early in the morning and will not be able to be with you tomorrow. I have to teach classes tomorrow, so we'll have to fly out at 6.45, but it's been a joy to be with you. Let me read what one uninspired author has written. Up and be doing, the time is brief, and life is as frail as an autumn leaf. The day is bright and the sun is high, ere long it will fade from the glowing sky. The harvest is ripe and the fields are wide, and thou at thine ease may not abide. The labors are few and far between, and death is abroad with a sickle keen. Go forth and labor, a crown awaits the faithful servant at heaven's gates. Work with thy might, ere the day of grace is spent, ere the night steals on apace. The Master has given this pledge divine, who winneth souls like the stars shall shine. The idea of a ready harvest, which is in urgent need of reapers that have a vision of what God wants to do with His church, is the major thrust of our lesson at this hour. John, the fourth chapter, is our text, and I hope you will turn there. Let me talk with you just a moment about some of the background, and then we'll read chapter 4, verses 34 and 5. Jesus is in Samaria. He's near the village of Sychar, according to verses 5 and 6. That's where Jacob's well is. His disciples had gone into the village to buy some food, and Jesus talks with the Samaritan woman while they're gone. You well remember that conversation. It was a sort of a questionable practice. He, most rabbis would not be seen talking with a woman out in public. Jesus tells her the details of her life, and she begins to perceive that he might be maybe a prophet and Jesus tells her that he is the Messiah. Then the disciples return and they see him talking with the woman and they wanted to ask why, but they had too much respect and dared not ask why. Then they try to get him to eat the food that they have brought and a little time has evidently passed and she has already returned to the village and she has told the people in the village, I've just talked with a man out there that doesn't know me, but yet he knows everything about me. This couldn't be the Christ, could it? And in fact, then, as the disciples try to get him to eat that food, he refuses the food because, according to verse 30, he sees the people streaming out from the village and coming toward him. And he says then, I have food, basically, that is more important. Listen to verses 34 and 35 in the New American Standard. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Some translations say they are white already unto harvest. Jesus says, don't say it's four months. We already have a harvest and it's here, it's now. Lift up your eyes, open your eyes, says one, tran one translation. The color of the, of the grain is changing, it's time now to do the harvesting. Open your eyes, be a people of vision, see what's there. I would suggest to you that if Jesus Christ were to come and speak to this church today, if it were possible, very probably Jesus would say to us, we need to open our eyes. We need to lift up our eyes. He would say, church, be a people of vision, analyze things, see what's really going on in the world and see what needs to be done. In the first place, I'm convinced he would say to us, lift up your eyes, church, and have a vision, get a vision of what really is going on in the world and see what's really there. Notice in the first place what the scriptures teach about the world. The world is the disobedient group of people, the vast majority of people, generally speaking. And since the time of Adam, the world has been out of step with God, out of step with its creator, disobedient. 
In 1 John 2, verses 15 and following, do not love the world or the anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God will live forever. Jesus tells us why the world is in such sad state. He tells us it's because it's following the wrong person. Because Satan is the prince of this world, as he calls him in John 12 and verse 31. In 1 John 5, verse 19, John the Apostle says, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's the same fellow Jesus had been talking about, the prince of this world. And those who follow him cannot possibly be in step with God and be right with God, for there is none righteous, no, not one, when we are following the prince of this world. Jesus and his disciples who were led by the Holy Spirit say that later in the Christian age, things will worsen. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and following, speaking even of Christians, Paul says this, The Spirit clearly says that in latter or after times some will abandon the faith and they will follow deceiving spirits and it will be as if those Christians were really a part of the world again. They won't be following God. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 13, the godly will be persecuted, says Paul, while evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And then the same Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 4, the time will come that there will be people that will want, they will be what teachers with itching ears, that is, teachers that are listening to hear what people want to be taught, and they will adapt their message to what people want to be taught. And especially in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it seems that evil, probably personified in the Son of Man, will become more and more powerful right up to the end time, and it'll seem that Satan has won the day completely. And then all of a sudden, Jesus will come in his second coming, and he will destroy him with the breath of his mouth, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 8. I don't know when Jesus Christ is coming. It may be 100 years. It may be 200 years. No man can know. But I do know we have a lot of wickedness in the world today. Even in the so-called nations, the so-called Christian nations, those who plan and say they are Christian nations like Britain and Italy and the U.S. and Germany. In fact, there have been many scandals over the last few years in various countries that call themselves Christian nations. In Britain, while I was living in Europe, there was a sex scandal in Parliament, the likes of which would curl your hair if you read the details of it. One time several years ago when I was walking along the edge of St. James Park with my children, I almost immediately as I observed what was going openly, the immorality of people lying on the grass, I got them away from St. James Park because I didn't want them to see what was going on openly there. And many of the countries of the world that call themselves Christian nations have had scandals like that. We've had our own, the Watergate scandal and several others that might be mentioned. In fairly recent times, many of our political leaders have espoused immorality, some of both parties, of the gays and of abortion and that sort of thing that political leaders would not have espoused a few years ago. But even worse than that, my brethren, is the fact it seems to me that religious leaders, or at least they call themselves religious leaders in our nation, openly accept things that are clearly contradictory to the Bible. I was in Denver, Colorado about nine years ago and picked up the Denver Post. It was 1986. There was a column by a very well-known so-called pastor in that particular city. And somebody had asked him, is it really true that the Bible condemns one person of the same sex having sexual activity with the, the person of the same sex, homosexuality in other words? And he said, absolutely not. That's all just intolerance and prejudice on the part of the people who oppose it. The Bible says nothing about that. I don't know what my uh, Bible the man reads. He must have torn out for Romans the first chapter, verses 18 and following. He surely tore out 1 Corinthians 6, 9, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, of heaven neither are the effeminate by perversion or homosexuals. That is, people who practice homosexual activity will not enter the kingdom of heaven, and that's clear in the scripture, but even religious leaders are acting like it's not in the Bible in many cases. In the so-called Christian nations today, I'm afraid, my brethren, that we sort of mix together religion and immorality as if they could blend together somehow. In fact, in a Gallup poll of just about 10 years ago now, I was impressed with what George Gallup said. He said in America, quote, religion is growing, but 
the level of ethics has declined. There is very little difference in behavior in the church and the unchurched. You see, more people, members of the church, but less morality. So we act like you can be a Christian and you can just live like you want to. Somebody says, well, you know, that's uh, probably in the big cities, like Chicago and New York, and I'd like to think it was all there, but unfortunately it isn't. It's even in the Bible Belt. In a recent year, when the national average of teenage pregnancies was 31 per 1,000 of the population, in Tennessee it was 37 for 1,000 of the population. And in Tennessee in 1990, there were 19 girls ages 10 to 17 that became pregnant every single day in the state of Tennessee, right in the middle of the Bible Belt. I think probably the national television program, Hee Haw, is a kind of an example of what happens so many times in America. I like Roy Clark's guitar picking, I don't know about you. But there are some things on that program that I deplore and that make me turn it off when I have it on. And that is, you have one moment, you have a quartet singing the old rugged cross or amazing grace. And 30 seconds later, you have half-naked women writhing in such a way as to generate lasciviousness in the male viewers. You know, that all fits together, the old rugged cross and, and immorality. Why don't you just put it all together? We do in America. Unfortunately, it's an indication of the kind of world we live in. I don't say that all is black, but the total scene in the U.S. and in many other so-called Christian nations is not very good, and it's not just a problem of statistics. These are matters, my brethren, that touch us where we are, where our lives are and are lived. Let me tell you of the plight of a family that some time ago came to a child care agency run by some of our brethren. We'll change the names, of course. The fellow we'll call Mr. Anderson. As he came to the church, to the agency run by the church, he described a marriage that had been marred by adultery. It was a five-year-old marriage, and he admitted there had been lots of selfishness and separation. He had tried many solutions, and finally he brought the children to, quote, give them to the church. He admitted he hadn't attended any church in 14 years, and at that point he came only because his wife had left him, and he had, we'll call him little Jamie. He was one, years old, one year old, and little Jody that was about two and a half, and they had not eaten in 24 hours, and so he wanted to give them to the church. And he did give them to the church. Yes, it touches us where we are, and it touches our families. My son and his wife several years ago with a house parents in, in Indiana for four young girls that came out of the same family, and they took them when they were about ages 6 through 11. And my son could not understand for some time why he could not get close to the two oldest girls until he found that the oldest two had been repeatedly raped by their own grandfather. Yes, it touches us where we are. And then we even have a mother in the Carolinas who straps her little children, her two precious little boys, in the seat and runs them off in the lake. Unfortunately, I believe the world is in bad condition. And I believe that if Jesus were here, he would say, church, don't be, don't just, Act like nothing is happening in the world. Look at the world. Try to read the signs. See how people are hurting. See how badly. Be a church of vision and look and see what is needed in the world, that the world is in terrible shape and it needs something. That's the first thing our Lord would say if he were to come and preach to us tonight, I believe. But there's a second thing the Lord would say, I believe. If he were able to speak directly to us tonight, he would say, church, be a church of vision. Lift up your eyes and see the source of your help, Jehovah God. Reevaluate the kind of help you have for your life. Let's be grateful with David that we have God's help. David exclaimed in Psalm 33, verses 20 and following, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help, our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. And again, the same David says in Psalm 27, verses 9 and following, you have been my helper. Do not reject me or, or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Oh, yes, people who really trust in God and turn to him, they have a great helper. There may well be some people in this very audience tonight who have been rejected by their own parents. Several years ago, I had a young man that we normally received in the school 
that I was directing in Florence, Italy, only people that were members of the church to help prepare them for service in the church. But one, on one occasion, an alumnus called me and he persuaded me to take in a young man by the name of Bruno of about 14 years of age, whose father had left him and got off to live with a German woman and never came back to Italy. And his mother had become very embitter embittered and put him in a Catholic orphanage. He had been abused sexually there, broke out, cut, he bore a big scar on his left arm. And he was just bitter about everything. And my, my students started studying with him and he was at least willing to study the Bible and we brought him to the Florence Bible School that I was directing and over the first year I had lots of problems with him. And as about after about a year I brought him into the office again with another problem and sat him down and was talking to him and right in the middle of the conversation he interrupted me and as he interrupted me I began to see a tear flowing out of one eye and he said, you, you know, a minute ago when I came in here, I almost called you Babo. Babo means daddy. He said, what would you have done if I had called you daddy? And I got out from behind the desk and walked around and pulled him out of his chair and hugged him and I said, I would have been honored. You are a creature of God. Creatures down here on the earth don't always love one another. Maybe even your parents didn't. You may have been rejected like Bruno, but let me tell you something. If you want to have God, your creator, on your side, he is on your side and he loves you and he wants to be your helper and he wants to be your guide. We need to thank God that we have God on our side. Again, here the psalmist, Psalm 121, verses 1 and following. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. He will watch over your coming out both now and forevermore. You're coming out and you're going in both now and forevermore. Somebody may say, well, that's the Old Testament. But it's in the New Testament too, my brethren. Listen to Paul in Philippians 4 verse 19. And my God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you have needs? If you'll come to him, you have a helper. You have someone who cares about you and someone who will follow you and someone who will guide you and someone who will protect you. One of the most beautiful chapters in this entire book, I think, is Psalm 139. I wish I had more time on it, but let me briefly note some of the characteristics according to that chapter that our great God, our great helper has. In fact, in the first six verses, God is all-knowing. You know, it seems sometimes that we're so small that surely God couldn't pay any attention to us. There are nearly six billion people in the world. How he could, could he know about me? But I'm not too small for God to know. He knows all about me when I rise up, when I sit down, and even my thoughts before I think them. God knows everything, my great God. In the second place, he is everywhere present, verses 7 through 12. Wherever I can go, if I go clear up into the heavens, if I go down into the grave, if I go east clear into the sunrise, and west clear into the great Mediterranean Sea, says the psalmist, God is there, and even if I go into the darkness, darkness is like the light to him. And God knows where I am and knows what I'm doing. In 1975, my nearly 19-year-old son who had been in Italy all of his life since four years of age and spoke Italian and only broken English and whose mentality was Italian and not American, needed to come back to the States to go to university. And we couldn't come, we felt like, for our work. I put him on the train in Rome, Italy to go to Brussels, Belgium and to make the change, or to Amsterdam rather, and to make the change there in the big airport by himself and to come back to an America that he didn't know very well. The last several months before he came back, I tried to keep getting his voice down so he wouldn't speak so loudly like he'd done all of his life. But I was awfully glad as I saw him off and put him on that train, I could say one word in Italian to him that he understood very well, and that was addio, A-D-D-I-O, and it means I commend you to God because God is not limited to America. He's not limited to Italy. God protects his people everywhere. God is everywhere, our great God. But a third thing about our God in that Psalm, he is all powerful, verses 13 through 16. Oh, he says, the Psalmist says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, verse 14. 
The human body is marvelous. You can cut it, but within just a few days, if it's not functioning properly as it generally does, it'll heal itself and you can hardly see the cut. And yes, the great God that made us and he now protects us and he fills our needs. There is victory for those who live in close communion with God. Our needs are met. Listen to the inspired John in 1 John 5, verses 4 and following. For everyone born of God has overcome the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. But maybe there are some in the audience tonight who may tend to say, Brother Edwards, I don't know. It sure sounds good, but your picture of God, I don't believe, is very realistic. You know, it sounds good, but does it really work in life? I say to you, my floundering brother or sister, no, you're wrong. Our God really does function in real life if we allow him to do it. Let me share an example with you of the experience of a young Christian in a southern state, a young man whose name was David. I'm going to read a lot of the words that he presented in a Wednesday evening service of a Southeastern Church of Christ several years ago. He said, my name is David. I'm a university student in so-and-so university. I graduated last quarter with a bachelor's degree in psychology and I'm in my first quarter of graduate school in rehabilitation counseling. I became a Christian in April of so-and-so year. I became convinced of the existence of God when I was in the fifth grade. I started searching for him then. I was baptized into Christ in the 10th grade. I graduated from high school. I received a scholarship from a Christian college to study and to become a preacher. But then just two weeks later after I received the scholarship, I went on a camping trip, dove into a river, smashed my face in the bottom and didn't come back to the top. Well, I did, but it was because others pulled me out and brought me back to the top. I woke up in the intensive care unit about a day later, couldn't move from my neck down, I couldn't feel. I had about five tubes sticking in and out of my body. I had a machine on my chest that counted how many times I breathed and the alarm was always going off. And I woke up to a very stark reality. It's the kind of stark reality that not too many of you will probably ever have to face, or at least, at least I hope you will not. I said to myself, David, you're never going to run track again or play tennis or ride your motorcycle. And it gripped my faith by my throat and stared it in its eyes and said to me like Job's wife said to him, curse God and die. And it caused me to do some very deep soul searching. I asked myself, what about your life, David? I said to myself as I lay there in the bed, it's devastated. You're a vegetable. You can't do anything for yourself anymore. Well, I said, what's your priority going to be, David? And reluctantly, I answered myself, my priority is to love God and do his will. Well, I said to myself, can you still do that, David? And finally, I said, I guess I can. And then I asked myself, well, what's your perspective going to be? And I answered, well, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal, and my citizenship is in heaven. And I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Well, what's your focus then, David? Well, it's obvious what I ought, it ought to be, I answered myself. It ought to be giving myself to others. Can you still do that, David, I asked myself. And finally, I answered, yes, I can still do that. And the last I knew, David from a wheelchair had been responsible over several months period for the conversion of numerous of his friends and colleagues because with the help of God, he had faced and won over a very difficult situation. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a great helper in Jehovah God. But the truth is, my brethren, that non-Christians don't know of our help. They don't know of our great God. They look in various places, but they don't find satisfaction because they're looking for the wrong things in the wrong places. And sometimes the weight of sin is so heavy upon them and they don't even understand it to where they never look up where help really comes from. If Jesus Christ were here today, I'm firmly convinced he would say, you need to be a people of vision. You need to reevaluate what you have in your heavenly father and the blessings and the protection and the help you have in him. Remember what you have. But in the third place, I'm convinced that if our Savior were to come, he would say, if you're going to be a people of vision, you need to lift up your eyes and look onto the white fields, the fields that are ready now for harvest. 
You see, the truth is, my brethren, those who have the need in the world and the great God who is the medicine and the helper for that need to be brought together. And whose job is that? That's mine and yours. Only Christians can tell who God is and what he can do for people. Come back to our text, if you will, with me now. Notice Jesus' situation there in John 4. He disdains material food because he sees people streaming out from the village of Sychar and he sees the urgent need. He says the fields are already white now unto harvest. I don't know how many of you were raised on the farm, but I was in southwest Missouri. Big family, eight children. We drove 12 miles to church. We never worked on Sunday. We never missed Sunday night. We never missed Wednesday night. We never missed any services, God being our helper. But I remember one time we worked on Sunday afternoon. We got back about 12.30 from church 12 miles away. We unpiled 10 of us out of that old sedan. And Dad said when we got out, boys, you've got 30 minutes to eat a bite, get your clothes on, be in the field. The reason was there was a storm coming. And we had a 15-acre uh, plot of oats, spring oats, that were just ready to harvest and there was a storm coming on. And at that time, your grain binders would not pick up the grain. You lost it when it went down and Dad didn't intend for us to lose it. We were poor people and we didn't have it to lose. And we worked all Sunday afternoon because that field was white to harvest. Jesus is talking about people when he talks about something that's urgent here. It was urgent to reach up and look out and get the word of life out to the people that needed it. Jesus says, it's time now. Look, see what needs to be done. That's what he taught his disciples then. That's what he'd like to teach us now through his word. I believe today the individual of the church that's really Christ-like will recognize the urgency of that work. The obedient Christian, the obedient individual will try first of all to evangelize here in our nation. As I've already intimated, our nation is not a Christian nation, really. A Baptist by the name of Cheney has published a book called Church Planting in the 20th Century. He points out that now in our nation we have 80 million people who say they are not members of anything. We have another 90 million people that though they may claim membership, they absolutely live like any pagan would. And he says that means we've got 70% of our population that are living just like pagans do and, and really Christianity has very little influence on them. And that's about the situation, I believe. We don't live in it. We live in a secular pagan nation. The majority of our nation is not Christian. Fortunately, there has been some Christian influence on it, but it is not a Christian nation. Now, regarding the churches of Christ, one source says between 79 and 90, we did begin growing again and we grew about three and a half percent. Probably that's true. But there are still in our own nation a lot of places that are unevangelized. One brother in his directory published in 1978 pointed out in his missions bulletin really that there were 10 counties where Wisconsin and Minnesota come together, 10 counties with a block of population of 530,000 people where we had not one single member of the Church of Christ. And as late as 1990 in that whole half million people, we still had only four small congregations and 93 members of the church. We've got a lot to do in our own nation. Our tendency is to say, my brethren, well, yeah, I know you really would ought to go out and evangelize people, but you know, <laughs> when you try to go, people won't accept it. They really aren't white. Well, I agree, some of them aren't ready to be harvested. I remember I was door knocking in a campaign in about 1980 with a young man by the name of Sean in Hibbing, Minnesota. I was preaching at night in the campaign and going door knocking with uh, some of the others in the daytime. And we went up to a very nice looking house, a beautiful house, must have been a $200,000, $250,000 house. Knock, nobody came. And so we put some information in the door and as we were leaving, the door opened behind us and I turned around to kind of apologize, but before I could open my mouth, a rather distinguished looking lady who didn't speak in a distinguished fashion cursed me like I've seldom been cursed, tore up the materials and threw it and told me to pick it up out of the yard and get out with it. I'm aware of the fact that not everybody accepts. But the same day, Sean and I, about two hours later, knocked on a door. A 17 and a half year old young man by the name of Bill came to it looked like his hair was clear down here to his shoulders, looked like it hadn't been washed and I don't know how long and I could smell liquor on his breath. 
And it was the kind of situation in which you almost wanted to say, you don't want a Bible study, do you? <laughs> but I didn't. I said, we find the Bible useful in dealing with problems in our lives. We'd like to try to study it with you, and we believe it could be helpful to you. Would you be willing to find some time today or tomorrow or this week to study the Bible with us? He didn't hesitate. He said, yeah, I believe I would. My life is in a mess, and I certainly need something. Bill Rupersich was baptized within two weeks and became a Christian. Yes, there are some people who will listen. They are white. What we need to do is do like the insurance salesmen do. They love their, the money they make off of it enough. They keep on going even though they have some refusals. We need to lift up our eyes and look toward the people and find the people that are willing even here in our own nation. But let's not stop there. We also need to evangelize in other nations. The Lord said, go into all the world. He didn't say, go into all of the United States. Paul said he tried to preach where Christ had not already been named, Romans 15, verse 20. Today it's a lot easier to find the message in the U.S. if you search than it is overseas in many places. It's true that we have made some progress in reaching out to other people. Just before World War II started in Europe, we had only eight small congregations, all of them as far as I know, in Great Britain. 38 years later, in 1977, we had 195 churches of Christ, some of them in 20 of the 35 different countries of, the, of, the, of Europe. At that time, it numbered 35. Five years ago, in the former Soviet Union, we had absolutely nothing. In August of this last year, I helped some people in Moscow sort of count up, and as best they could count up, there are now 100 Yes, they're struggling congregations, but a, a hundred small congregations in the former Soviet Union. We've made some progress. Let's don't be discouraged. But the truth is, my brethren, that Moscow has about a hundred Christians, as best as I can count, and counting the suburbs, there are 12 million people there. In Italy, after the years of work we've done there, we have about 1,200 sable, solid Christians, and there are 62 million people there. Summarizing the situation outside the United States, and these are new figures from the ones that appear in the book and more updated. A brother by the name of Gaston Tarbot has come up with this count in April of this last year. There are now 242 countries in the world, as he counts it. We have churches of Christ in 133 of them. But that means we have 109 countries with no members and no workers of the churches of Christ. Like, for example, in Morocco, there are 26 million people. We don't have any Christians. We have no workers. I was in Egypt this summer in Cairo, a city of 15 million people. We didn't, couldn't find a church meeting anywhere, though we tried before and tried during the time we were there. We hear there are about 53 members in the country of Egypt, but none of them was meeting in Cairo where 15 million people are. The world has 5.6 billion people, 95% of the population lives outside the United States, and well over 90% of the preachers are preaching to people inside the United States. By the way, if we had preachers, my brethren, in the same proportion in the United States as we have them outside the United States, we would have less than 100 preachers for the entire United States of America, and I strongly suspect there were 20, uh, within 20 miles of here, there were more than 100 preachers last Sunday morning in churches of Christ standing up to preach, or at the very most 30. We need to look. We need to see what needs to be done. And yes, outside in the other countries, there are some who are receptive. Even in those countries where some people say, well, those aren't receptive countries. For example, we went to New Zealand in a campaign with students of ours about two years ago in the summer, in 93. And we knocked 80 doors in a row with no positive response at all at the doors. But in the very next block, within six doors, we set up two Bible studies, one of them an entire family, and some of those were baptized. Yes, even some in those so-called non-receptive countries are white to harvest. But some places, they are very receptive. I had the privilege of holding the first meeting downtown in the uh, Symphony Hall of Bratislava, Slovakia, about two summers ago. 
And we advertised hoping we'd have 100 or so. We had 750 people fill the hall for a musical program we had. Then we gave a little, we asked them to stay for preaching and over 400 people stayed for Hear Me Preach on the love of God and various other topics. And dozens of them gave their names for follow-up studies in clean Russia this last summer, this last August. In a four-night meeting, we started off in a, in a hall that would seat 550 people. We started off with 370 and ended up the last night trying to jam nearly 1,300 people in a hall that would seat only 550. And we took literally dozens, in fact, about 35 names of people that were willing to have follow-up weekly studies. What do all these white fields mean to us, my brethren? Oh, they mean lots of things. It means, first of all, that leaders in congregations like this one, and I know this is a congregation that's done quite a lot comparatively, but my brethren, we need to do more, and you'll think I'm radical for a moment, certainly, and you may wind up thinking I'm radical, but we need to plan not to support just two or three missionaries, more missionaries in the next three or four years. We need to plan to support 10 or 15 more because we can do it if we want to do it. We need to lay plans to support 10 and 15 full-time workers with congregations of this size and above. And we need to pick the young men and challenge them. And we need to become role model congregations so others will look to us and they'll see that we're giving of our money to reach out to the lost. And then they will catch the vision also of doing what God wants them to do. But by the way, members, leaders can't do that without the rest of us. No way leaders can lead where members aren't willing to go. Those of us who are members need to catch the vision of the fields that are white unto harvest and see what we need to be doing. We need, first of all, to pray, to beseech the Lord of harvest for laborers, Matthew 9, 37 and following, and ask our children to be among the later laborers and we'll support them in prayer and financially. And we need to live a bit lower on the hog and give more than we have been giving and encourage leaders and say, we want you to, to take on more missionaries and we will support you. And some of us go ourselves on vacation in short-term work and maybe some of us go full-time and stay in those fields to help. Let me give you a vision that I shared with a congregation of 600 members in Montgomery, Alabama just this last weekend. They had been supporting a couple of missionaries. But I talked to some of the leaders and they invited me, allowed me to come down and the leaders cooperated with me and they had a missionary back and they let me talk to the leaders on Saturday about three times and then challenge the congregation on Sunday morning. I got them to bring statistics or get statistics from the Bureau of Vital Records in the state capitol. We found out what the average income was per capita. They had 600 members, just a little over a meeting. We figured up and they were giving at that point $12,300 a Sunday. We figured up what they would be giving if they were giving 10%. You want to guess what it would have been? 24,000 they were giving about 5% of their total income and if they start giving 10% they would be giving 24,000 a Sunday in addition to what they're already supporting they would have had 600 they will have $614,000 a year to spend on missionaries if you support them at the rate of 40,000 per missionary that would be 15 missionaries plus in addition to what they're already doing and by the way the elders asked to meet with me Sunday afternoon and we prayed about it and they said we want to become a role model congregation and Sunday night they had announced to their congregation they're going to see if they can't get that contribution within two or three years up to seven or eight percent and then on up to ten. Wouldn't it be great if they could begin supporting in addition to two, the, the two or three they're supporting 15 more in the next five or so years? But that's not impossible right here my brethren. And there are congregations all over the brotherhood. And if we could get 15 or so of us to doing it in various places in the United States, then those would infect others. We need to be people of vision. Brethren, our God is a great God and a languishing world needs to hear of his love and mercy. God help us to be people of vision. But let me repeat in conclusion. If we're going to be the kind of people of vision that gets the job done properly for the Lord, we must learn to think of others in those white fields. I want to close with the story I read some time ago that I presume is true. It's the story of a Protestant preacher in a large Protestant denominational church in a large U.S. city. Several years ago, 30 or so, when not many people even in his congregation drove Cadillacs, his brother was a Cadillac dealer. 
And for several years he had asked to give his brother, who was the preacher of Cadillac, he wanted to just give it to him. And he resisted and said, no, not too many of my people drive Cadillacs. But finally then he gave in after several offers. And he went down one Monday morning, he tells, and he had gone in and it was a new black Cadillac with lots of chrome on it. And he went in and got the papers and the keys. And after everything had been signed, he came out to get in his car. And standing there, there was a little boy of about 10 years of age with dirty clothing and no shoes looking wide-eyed at his car. And he said, I thought, well, if my brother gives it to me, surely I can give a kid a ride in it and make him happy. And so he said, Sonny, would you like to take a ride in my car? And he said, the little boy's eyes got wide and he said, oh, mister, would you? And then he said he stopped right in the middle of the sentence and he said, but I couldn't, mister. You see, I'm all dirty and I'd get your new car dirty. And the man said, I thought, well, that's nice courtesy from a little kid like that. But he thought about my car. He said, come on, Sonny, I got a paper here. He put the paper down on the seat so you can sit on that. I'll take you for a ride. And he said, the little boy said to him, Oh, mister, thank you so much. But he said, could I ask you something then if you're so nice as to take me for a ride? Would you take me out to so-and-so street? And, and he said, then if you could stop just a little bit after you get there. And he said, I knew what he's going to do. He wanted to, for me to wait and he was going to go in and get his friends and maybe his brothers and sisters and bring them out and brag about the car that he had ridden in. And he said, sure enough, he got there and the little boy said, right here, mister, just a moment and I'll be right back. But he said he went right into his own house as best he could tell. And he didn't come out with brothers and sisters to brag to. He came out with a little brother in braces that he called Nicky. And he brought him to the edge of the car and he said, you see this car? That man's brother gave it to him. And he said, you know, I don't need a car. I can walk around. I have good legs and I can see all the toys in the store, but you can't. But he said, do you know, Nikki, that they have cars that are equipped for crippled people? And he said, one day I'm going to be a brother like that man's brother and I'll get you a car that's equipped and you'll be able to see all the things I see. And the preacher said he felt about that tall. He had thought the little boy was selfish and all the while he was thinking of others. If we're ever going to get the job done for the Lord, we are going to have to, my brethren, be people of vision who think not of spending more and more on ourselves, but who think of spending on people that are ripened to harvest in the mission fields of the world. God help us to do it. Amen.